Hi, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and today we're going to be looking at the epics and the geological changes that happened for complex life. The Cambrian, 541 million years ago, saw the first complex life, with trilobites and then some forms of crustacean evolving and being found as microfossils. The Burgess Shale of British Columbia has given a great wealth of insight into the creatures of this time period. As it was the first time life was truly experimenting with new forms, a great number of strange invertebrates would appear during this time period, such as Hallucigenia, a prehistoric velvet worm, or Anomalocaris, a prehistoric sea predator. Life remained fairly unchanged though, at least until the Ordovician and Silurian periods starting 485 million years ago. In these periods you would see the evolution of the first families that we would go to recognize today, with large mollusks like Orthoceras and giant Eurypterids feeding upon the smaller invertebrates of the time and some of the fish which evolved during this time. Geologically, we have the beginning of the Appalachian Mountains from the eastern United States and the Caledonian Mountains from Norway. These were once part of the same massive mountain range which formed during the Ordovician. Initially glacier-free, the end of the Ordovician saw the Hinatian Glacial Period, in which Great glaciers rose across the southern continents of Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and South America. Because the glaciation period was short, this caused a drop in sea levels, which ended up leading to the extinction of many of the species of invertebrates which dominated the planet. Because of this, fish were able to colonize the new reefs that would form during the Silurian. The Devonian lasted from about 420 million years ago to about 358 million years ago. Sometimes called the Age of the Fishes, this is the time period where we found our modern-day ray-finned fishes, lobe-finned fishes, and cartilaginous fishes which we see today. However, there were also placoderms, fish with hard bony plates over their heads, which dominated the period with large predators like Dunkleosis belonging to this family. During the Middle Devonian, some of the lobe-finned fish, like Tetalik, would take their first tentative steps onto land eventually evolving into the ancestors for all modern-day land vertebrates. Not all was well for the Devonian, however, with the Kelwasser event and the Hangenberg event being two extinctions which would close out the Devonian, with the deaths of 50% of all species. The Devonian was followed by the Carboniferous period, from 358 million years ago to 298 million years ago. This period saw the evolution of both reptiles and gynosperm plants, which would be plants with seeds rather than just using spores to spread. With only limited animal development and evolution on land, these trees would come to dominate much of the planet, eventually leading to an atmosphere that was up to 35% oxygen. This allowed many of the insects and arthropods of the time to grow to massive sizes, with species like Meganeura, which was hawk-sized and resembled a dragonfly, or Arthropleura, which was an 8-foot long relative to millipedes. However, by the mid-carboniferous, the tetrapods would have evolved into the crown groups we see today, the amphibians and the amniotes, which would become reptiles and mammals. They set themselves up to become much more successful than these species later on. Near the end of the Carboniferous, many of the southern continents would glaciate over again, causing a drop in water levels, which would lead to the collapse of many of the rainforest systems that had dominated the period, and leading to an extinction of many of the large amphibian and reptile species which lived in the period. The Permian, lasting from 298 million years ago to 251 million years ago. This period saw the creation of many of the red rocks in my home state of Arizona that you can see in places like Sedona. The early Permian saw synapsids become the dominant group of animals on the planet, with species like Dimetrodon being the apex predator in many environments, and Adaphrosaurus being the large herbivore roaming the land. In addition, the ancestors to turtles, scaled lizards, and the archosaurs all diversified during this period. With trees, we have the first recognizable modern trees, with species like ginkgos, conifers, and cycads all evolving and showing up in the fossil record during the Permian. The Middle Permian saw Olson's extinction, a small event which saw species like Dimetrodon being replaced with other synapsids such as the Gorgonopsids. However, their reign as dominant predator would be short-lived, as an even larger extinction loomed on the horizon. The end Permian was marked by the greatest extinction of all time, with over 95% of all marine life falling, and almost 70% or more of life on land dying out in the same way. 
One of the survivors from this extinction, Leistrosaurus, can account for as much as 95% of some of the fossils found from fossil beds from the time period. For fossil fuel companies, this time period is known as the coal gap because there is nothing to find there that would have produced coal. There were not large amounts of biomass to be compressed down into coal or oil. Almost everything died. Recovery took tens of millions of years. Which leads us to the Triassic from 251 to 201 million years ago. After the long recovery from the Permian extinction, the small synapses that were left would eventually evolve into the ancestors to modern day mammals. Meanwhile, the archosaurs would diversify wildly, evolving into things like phytosaurs, edosaurs, pterosaurs, and of course, the dinosaurs. This leads us to the early Jurassic, starting 201 million years ago. Here we see the beginnings of the breakup of Pangaea, with Gondwana becoming the supercontinent in the south, and Laurasia being the supercontinent in the north. This would lead to other split-ups we would see in the future, such as Carcharodontosaurs being dominant in the southern hemisphere, and Tyrannosaurs becoming dominant at the end of the Cretaceous in the northern hemisphere. During this time period, there were no ice caps. And in fact, some dinosaurs have even been found from this time period coming from Antarctica, notably Carlophosaurus. During this period, dinosaurs firmly established their dominance on the planet, with the rest of their archosaur competitors dying out or evolving into species that would eventually become modern day crocodiles and alligators. We see the final separation of northern and southern continents during the late Jurassic, which ended 145 million years ago. During this time, Europe was a series of archipelagos, with dinosaurs swimming between them and potentially being hunted by large sea reptiles like Leopleurodon while doing so. On land, Allosaurs were some of the largest predators of the time period, with Allosaurus and its relatives being found from North and South America, Africa, and Portugal. Meanwhile, Tyrannosaurs were small, with species like Guanlong and Proceratosaurus barely reaching 10 feet. Even smaller species were testing feathers for flight for the first time during this period. However, not everything was small, as the late Jurassic also brought giants, like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus to begin roaming North America. During the early Cretaceous 145 million years ago, there were still not any ice caps. In fact, some dinosaurs found from the aptly named Dinosaur Cove in Australia would have actually lived below the Arctic Circle. In Northern Africa, Spinosaurus lurked the waterways and feathered dinosaurs like Microraptor and Eutyrannus prowled the Chinese forests. South America saw the bizarre Amargosaurus while large pterosaurs like Coloborhynchus and Tapehara flew overhead. In North America, the Western Interior Seaway flooded much of the central part of the continent, separating it out into two parts, Laramidia on the west and Appalachia on the east. While we only know limited number of dinosaurs that actually lived in Appalachia, we do have a few species, such as Dryptosaurus and Appalachiosaurus coming from there. However, on the western side of the continent, Laramidia, we have a broad number of species, such as Acrocanthosaurus, Sonorosaurus, and Utah Raptor. The first flowering plants evolved during this time period. During the late Cretaceous, we see the continents becoming more familiar to what they are today, with Australia and Antarctica splitting up, the split of Africa and South America, and the closing of the Western Interior Seaway, which would leave South Dakota a somewhat balmy swamp environment for Tyrannosaurus 66 million years ago. Dinosaurs were still thriving throughout the Cretaceous. However, the pterosaurs had started to become outcompeted in a lot of smaller niches by birds. This meant that the pterosaurs had to grow to massive sizes to stay competitive in their environment, with species like Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsigopteryx growing as tall as a giraffe, yet still maintaining the ability to fly. A meteor impact in the early Caribbean Sea brought a sudden end to the Cretaceous, and left pterosaurs, large sea reptiles, and non-avian dinosaurs extinct. In addition, 50% of other species also went extinct. This would open the gateway for mammals to start evolving and filling the niches that the dinosaurs once dominated. After the brief Paleocene, a 10 million year recovery period, the Eocene began at 56 million years ago. During this period, continental collision would start to eliminate many of the shallow inland seas. However, parts of Eurasia 
and North Africa would still be covered in water. During the recovery, mammals began to fill the niches that had once been monopolized by the dinosaurs. The exception of this would be South America, where forest rackets, or terror birds, would dominate until South America made a landfall with North America, forming the Isthmus of Central America. The Eocene was followed by another transitional period, which is often seen as the transition between the warmer climates that had existed beforehand and the more modern environments that we see today. This would lead us into the Miocene, 23 million years ago. During the Miocene, Earth would develop the first ice caps it had seen in potentially 260 million years. However, these were still small, as North and South America hadn't yet connected, meaning warm waters from the equator were still free to flow around the planet. Here we also see India making landfall with Asia, rising the Himalayas out of what was once the ocean floor. Additionally, throughout the period the ice caps would continue to expand, lowering water levels and giving us the continents shapes that we are more familiar with. The Pleistocene, more commonly known as the Ice Age. From 2.5 to just over 10,000 years ago, this period saw the closing of the Isthmus of Panama which cut off the warm currents that had flowed around the planet since the breakup of Pangaea. Because of this drop in sea levels, Australia and Papua New Guinea became one island, the Southeast Asian archipelago became a peninsula, and Ireland and Great Britain became united with mainland Europe. The world has always been changing for the millions of years that complex life has been around. To think our world now wouldn't change would be childish, but to think that this change is natural is also childish. Thanks for watching, a special thanks to the researchers and to my wonderful editor once again. There are over 500 million years covered in only 12 minutes in this video, so I'm sure that I've missed things. So you can leave a comment or tweet me at raptor underscore chatter for the things that you find interesting that you think I missed. The reoccurring theme of the episode, the oceans changed suddenly and then extinctions happened. So don't go extinct, save the planet, save the oceans, take care.